Hello, George Romanich here. Today we are going to investigate a beautiful problem related to an inclined plane in, and a ball that is rolling down that plane. The question is, what is the effect of the Coriolis force on the motion of the ball down the inclined plane? The text of the problem is now on your screens. So as you will see, the solution to this problem is absolutely beautiful and we will discuss it towards the end of this video. So the problem setup can be something like this. We have an inclined plane like so and it is going into the blackboard and there is angle of this incline, and I will call this angle S, slope of, the, of this incline plane. So this is the plane, and here there is a ball that starts sliding down this incline plane. The initial velocity of the ball is zero, so we let the ball here and the gravity takes over and the ball rolls down the plane. The question is, what is going to be the effect of the Coriolis force on this motion? To investigate that, let's look at this problem from this side. So let's replicate this figure, maybe here. So this is the inclined plane we are talking about. Here is the angle S. And let's say the ball is positioned over here at time t equals zero. So velocity of the ball is zero and the position of the ball is also zero, which means I will position my coordinate system right here at the initial position of this ball. Now my coordinate system has this axis, I will call it x, and uh, this will be z, and therefore y is into the page. y axis is into the page, or y axis is along these sides of the inclined plane. What are the forces that are acting on this ball? Well, there is gravity acting down, mg, and clearly, there is normal force acting along the z-axis, normal force n. Now, I will assume that this incline or this slope of the incline is very, very small, so that I can use small angle approximation. And you will see why that is very useful. So let's decompose gravity into this z direction and x direction. Notice if this is angle s, then this over here also need to be angle s because this line is normal to this line and this line is normal to this and therefore this angle needs to be the same as this angle. So this over here would be mg uh, sine, uh, so this would be mg sine alpha and this line over here would be mg cosine alpha. And now we will write the second Newton's law, the greatest law ever discovered for this ball. So the second, the second Newton's law says that mass times acceleration of this ball is the sum of all forces that are acting on this object. Well, let's write forces in the x direction. In the x direction, we have 
that in the positive x direction, uh, so mass times acceleration in the x direction is equal. So we have this negative component of gravity minus mg sine alpha. Why negative? Because it is acting in the opposite direction of x axis. So minus mg sine s. I can see now I messed up. It's not alpha. Uh, everywhere sh here should be s because I call this angle s, not alpha. So sine of this slope s And uh, don't forget, now we also have Coriolis force acting in the x direction. And that would be uh, plus mass of the ball F times V, where V is a marginal component of the velocity of the ball positive northward, or rather positive in the positive y direction into the blackboard. Now, in the y direction, I will have that mass times acceleration of this, of this ball in the y direction. There is no gravity in the y direction. So we will only have Coriolis force, which is minus m f times u, where u is velocity positive in the x direction. In atmospheric sciences, that would be eastward. Of course, again, this is a little bit more advanced video, so I assume you already know these expressions. If you don't, then definitely this is not the first video on Coriolis force that you should watch. You should familiarize yourself with these expressions. Of course, f is Coriolis parameter 2 omega sine phi, where omega is angular velocity of the Earth, and phi is the latitude where this experiment is taking place. And finally, in the z direction, we have, in the positive z direction, we have, uh, sorry, mass times acceleration in the z direction. In the positive, we have n, normal force. In the negative, we have minus mg cosine s, mg cosine of this slope s. Let me just erase this alpha so it doesn't confuse you. So what I was saying, this is not, of course, alpha, but rather s. And here is not alpha, but sine of s, because I call this angle s. OK. Now. What we will do is we will assume that this inclination is very, very small, which means that Taylor series approximation of cosine of angle S is equal uh, 1 plus S squared over 2 factorial uh, minus. S uh, 1 minus S squared over 2 factorial plus S 4 over 4 factorial minus 3 dots. And sine of this angle S in Taylor series approximation will be S minus S cubed over 3 factorial plus S to power 5 over 5 factorial minus three dots. So, of course, as pretty much always, we will ne neglect these higher order terms. And when we neglect higher order terms, notice that sine s can be approximated with the angle s, where angle needs to be in radians, and cosine can be approximated as one which means this cosine is approximated as 1, and this sine can be approximated as the angle S itself, thanks to Taylor series expansion. And uh, 
because this incline is very, very small, we assume, therefore, that there are no acceleration in the vertical direction. The accelerations are only taking place in the x direction, which means from the third equation, we get that this normal force is simply mg. And that tells us, well, it's the same as if the ball were, was on a horizontal plane, just like me standing. Gravity is acting down, normal force is acting up, there is balance, and that's it. And we had this approximation already in our problem on uh, Foucault and pendulum. So I suggest you check that problem. Now, notice that in the other problems, ma uh, in the other directions, masses cancel. So I don't need to know what is the mass of this ball. Okay. So let's rewrite what we have so far. So we have result that in the x direction, acceleration in the x direction, which is du dt, is equal minus g times s plus fv. And in the y direction, we have that dv dt, that's this acceleration, is equal negative f times u. And this is in the z direction. So now we need to solve this system of differential equations and the solution of this system will give us trajectory of this ball that is rolling down this inclined plane. How do we do this? Well, we will differentiate this equation with respect to time, so I get du dt, and then this du dt will be plugged into this equation. So from here, so we differentiate this with respect to time, and that will mean that du dt is equal minus 1 over f, uh, d second v dt squared. That's this equation over here. So now I take this and I plug it in here. So I will have here that minus 1 over f d second v dt squared is equal, the right hand side is minus gs plus fv. Or, let's move everything to the left side, not everything, just v terms. So I would have here minus 1 over f d second v dt squared. This will go to the left side, minus fv equals minus gs. And I will multiply now everything with negative f. Multiplying with negative f, I get here d second v dt squared plus f squared v equals g s f. And this is second order differential equation, but non-homogeneous. So we have to solve this equation, and this is now the realm of mathematics. You need to know how to solve second order non-homogeneous differential equations. If you don't, well now you will learn. So in this case, we first find solution of the homogeneous part of this equation, which is the left side, and then we find one particular solution of the non-homogeneous part and a linear combination of these two solutions represents the solution of non-homogeneous second order uh, linear differential equation. So I will not go into great details, you have to know mathematics 
uh, in order to, to tackle this problem. So the characteristic equation for the left side, and I already described this in more details in many previous videos, characteristic equation for the left side will be some k squared, squared because it's second order differential equation, plus f squared equals zero. You get this, this is called characteristic equation of this homogeneous differential equation, you get this by seeking for solution in exponential form. At any rate, notice that here we have that k squared is equal minus f squared, or k1 is equal uh, is equal uh, i f, where i is imaginary unit, and k2 is equal minus i f. So we have this, which means that the solution for the, for the homogeneous part of this equation is that v h homogeneous as a function of time is equal some constant c1, which can be complex in principle, c1 cosine f t plus some constant c2 times sine f t. Again, if you are confused with what I'm writing, you just have to know mathematics uh, because I'm skipping some parts over here, but I covered these parts in previous videos. Okay, so this is homogeneous solution of this differential equation. Now, how do we deal with non-homogeneous part? Well, this is actually as simple as it gets because our non-homogeneous part is simple constant. G is constant, S is constant, F is constant. So there is no nasty function over there and there is no dependency on uh, time, T. So we will use the method of uh, undetermined coefficients to find the right hand side of this, to find particular solution. Uh, you can also use the method of uh, variation of coefficients, which is more powerful, but there is no need to use it for this simple case. So the method of undetermined coefficients says that my, let's say, particular solution of this non homogeneous oops, not y, uh, so v, that's my variable, so vp as a function of time is equal, so undetermined coefficients that correspond to non-homogeneous part of this equation, well, it's just some coefficient, I will call it b. Because this is constant, I'm matching coefficient that is constant. I don't have to put here sine of something or, or cosine of something or uh, any function of time whatsoever because this is constant. If you know how to solve these types of equations, you know what I'm talking about. So we see that dvp dt is equal zero because uh, differentiation of constant is zero, and that is also the second derivative of this particular solution. If first derivative is zero, second derivative has to be zero too. Well, I take now this and I plug it in this equation, so we get that the second derivative is zero plus f squared v, there is no first derivative in that equation, v is b equals right hand side g s f. And notice that this f in this square cancels and from here we get that b is equal g s divided by f. That is my b, which means that particular solution is equal g s f. 
and it's not even a function of time, as you can see. So the general solution of this equation, therefore, so V of t is equal V homogeneous of t plus V particular of t. Well, uh, well, let me write it here. So V of t will be equal homogeneous part is C1 cosine ft plus c2 sine ft and plus particular solution is over there gs divided by f and this is the solution of this second order linear non-homogeneous differential equation where c1 and c2 are undetermined coefficients. But we can determine at least one of these coefficients now from our initial conditions. So we said that at time equals 0, u is equal v, and that is equal 0. So initial velocity of the ball is 0. We, we don't kick the ball, we just place it on this incline and then it starts rolling down thanks to gravity. So keeping in uh, using those initial conditions, so v of 0 is 0, so I will have 0 is equal c1 cosine of 0 is 1, so times 1, plus c2 sine of 0 is 0, so times 0, which means this one is 0, and plus uh, g times s divided by f. This is g. It's a little bit poorly written, but this is g. And from here, we can conclude that c1 is equal minus g s divided by f. Okay? Which means that I can plug this in over here and express v as dy dt because I am interested in trajectory, so I go into displacements. dy dt, dy dt is v, is equal c1 c1 is this, minus gs divided by s times cosine ft plus, I still don't know c2, plus c2 sine ft and plus gs divided by f. Now I integrate this, so I will integrate this whole equation with respect to time and the limits of my integral, time is going from 0 to time t. 0 is the moment when we release the ball from the inclined plane. So of course this is differential equation that separates variables, so I would just multiply with dt. So here solution would be that y as a function of time is equal. Now, this is integral ft, and in a previous video I showed you how to solve these types of integrals. This is very simple, you just use substitution. So integral of cosine is uh, sine, which, mean in which means that the integral of minus cosine should be minus sine, so minus gs divided by f. But when I solve this integral, this f will also drop down. So I will have f squared times sine of uh, ft. Integral of uh, sine is minus cosine, so minus c2 divided by f, divided by f again after solving this integral cosine ft 
And here, plus, this is just constant, so I will have gs divided by f times t. But now I can use, again, my initial conditions that say that at time t equals 0, velocities are 0, but position is also 0 because this is where I placed my coordinate system. So x is equal y equals z equals 0. So that's initial condition, which means that y of 0 is 0 is equal sine of 0 is 0, so this would be 0, minus cosine of 0 is 1, so we get C2 over F times 1, and plus T equals 0, that means this is 0, which means from here, because everything is 0, but f is not 0, it means that c2 needs to be 0. So we determine coefficient c2 based on our, uh, using our initial conditions. So let's write the final expression, therefore, maybe here. Well, final expression for y, and then we have to find uh, x. So y, as a function of t, is equal. c2 is 0, so this term disappears. This term disappears. Uh, I can maybe speed this up a little bit. So I will factor out gs f. So if I factor g times s divided by f. Here I will have t, and here I will have minus sine f t divided by f. Okay? Or Or y of t is equal g s f f t f minus sine f t. Or I can write that y of t is equal, I will combine these two f's. So g s divided by f squared which multiplies f times t minus sine ft. And this is trajectory of this ball in the y direction. And y direction in this figure is positive into the blackboard, and in this figure, this is y direction across this uh, slope. Now, let me nicely erase the blackboard, and then we will find the x component of the trajectory. That's very simple. We take this solution, or we take v, and uh, we plug it here in this equation for the x component. Let me erase blackboard. So I erased blackboard. Just to recap, we found y component of the trajectory. Now we have to find the x component of the trajectory of this ball that is rolling down the inclined plane. And to find the x component, we will use two equations that we derived. So we have differential equation for acceleration in the x direction, and we found expression for the v component. So I will plug this over here and integrate this to find u, and then again integrate to find x. So du dt from the first equation over here is equal minus gs plus f, and instead of v, I write this expression, minus gs f cosine ft 
plus gs divided by f. Notice that f will cancel everywhere and I will have that du dt is equal minus gs minus gs cosine ft and plus gs. So gs, uh, uh, negative gs and positive gs cancel and we get that du dt is equal minus gs cosine ft. So I will immediately integrate this equation with respect to time and the time is going from zero to some time t. When I do that, this will be that u as a function of time is equal integral of cosine is sine, which means the integral of minus cosine is minus sine. So gs divided by f, f comes from this uh, cosine times sine ft. But now I need to, and this, uh, and this left hand side of course is dx dt. That is uh, displacement in the x direction. So again I will integrate this one more time with respect to to time and time goes from 0 to t and uh, here I will get that x as a function of time is equal. So integral of sine is minus cosine which means that integral of minus sine is uh, so uh, uh, integral of sine is minus cosine, which means integral of minus sine is cosine. Uh, am I heavy? I always uh, mess up. You see, when you're doing things live and your brain stops working. But I'm not going to cut this video. I'm going to struggle here. Uh, no, integral so derivative of sine is cosine, which means integral of sine is minus cosine, which means minus sine, that should be cosine. So I should get here gs divided by f cosine in the limit cosine ft, but of course here there is one more f and this is going in the limits between 0 and t. So x of t is equal gs f squared, so cosine ft minus the lower limit, cosine of 0 is 1, so minus 1. And that's the solution in, of the x component, and I will rewrite it here in the following form. I will say this is equal minus gs f squared. So I will have minus, so I can flip these. So this will be 1 minus cosine ft. I flipped it so cosine and sine look uh, similar here. And this, my dear subscribers and people that are watching this without subscribing, is the trajectory of the ball rolling down this inclined plane. Now you might look into this solution and say, what is this? Well, trajectory that has these components in the x and y direction is called cycloid. And cycloidal motion 
has the following form. Let's say this is my incline plane. Okay. This is that inclination S. I'm just replicating that figure. I drop the ball over here and the ball starts sliding down the incline plane. Trajectory of the ball prescribed by these equations will be like this. Of course, in uh, this direction. And so on. This trajectory is called cycloid. Uh, cycloid is also if you have a transmission line and the uh, lines that are hanging on these uh, poles have also a cycloidal uh, pattern. Another instance where cycloid shows is if you have, a, let's say you have just a simple cylinder and you, you fix a point, let's call it point P over here, and now you roll this cylinder over in this direction, the trajectory that point P exhibits in time is also called cycloid. But we are here not interested in this, we are interested in uh, this. So, how do we explain this motion of the ball down the inclined plane using Coriolis force? This is the beautiful part where we need to make sense of the mathematical solution. Well, it's not that difficult. What, what is happening here is, first of all, we are neglecting friction. So, this ball has initial velocity zero, it starts rolling down thanks to gravity, and it is picking up speed. As it is picking up speed, Coriolis force is affecting the motion to the right. To the right, because we are assuming this is in the northern hemisphere. So, as the ball is going down, Coriolis force is deviating it towards the right. But as it is doing that, velocity of the ball is increasing because we have acceleration in the x direction caused by gravity. So as the velocity of the ball is increasing, Coriolis force is also increasing, and deviation becomes more and more pronounced. So somewhere here, the velocity of the ball is highest in terms of the uh, v component, and therefore Coriolis force is also deviating this very strongly towards the right. So at some point, the ball starts rolling up the plane. The ball starts going up the plane because it has high velocity and Coriolis force is stronger than the gravity. Gravity is still pushing down, but Coriolis force is deviating this towards the right. And the ball starts, in this point over here, starts rolling up the slope. But as it is doing that, it is losing velocity. It is losing velocity because it is going against gravity. And as it is losing velocity, Coriolis force is weakening. Coriolis force is weakening. You can see that deviation towards the right is less and less. And at one point, the ball reaches the same height from which it was dropped. Same height because we neglect friction. Uh, and then the pattern repeats itself. At this point, velocity of the ball is zero, Coriolis force is zero, therefore, but the ball starts rolling down, Coriolis force acts to the right, to the right, to the right, and here, when velocity is very high, Coriolis force is highest, and turns the ball completely up the slope, the ball again goes against the slope, loses velocity, Coriolis force weakens, the ball ends up here and the pattern repeats itself in the absence of friction. This, is, this motion is called cycloid and these are equations uh, in the y and x direction that are describing 
cycloidal pattern. Now, let's do an experiment. Uh, I have somewhere here, let me find in my bag, if I didn't lose it. Ah, here I have two marbles, two marbles. The next thing that I need is inclined plane. I put marbles on the desk because this is horizontal surface, they don't move. They don't move because normal force is equal gravity. You remember at the beginning of this video, N is equal mg on the... So here, gravity is acting down, normal force from the table is acting up, these two are in the equilibrium, and this is standing still. Let me just see on the video how this is visible. Okay, it's quite visible. Let's see if the black one is better. See, I'm doing these things live. Yeah, it's better, but it is rolling. So, if I incline this plane, if I incline this plane and I release this ball, do you think we will get this cycloidal motion? Because cycloidal motion means the ball should go like this and so on. Let's see. This is small inclination angle that we assumed over here. Let's see. Nothing happened. Let's see with the black one. Maybe it didn't have enough space to roll there. So let's start from here. Let's make inclination even smaller. Let's see. Nothing happened. Does it mean that physics and atmospheric sciences do not work? Why didn't we see this pattern? Think about it. Pause the video and think about it. Well, the reason is, of course, this effect is very, very small. This effect is extremely small. There is no way you can see it on this table using these velocities that we had here. Let me give you an example. If we are on planet Earth, and we are on planet Earth, that means G is 9.81 meters per second squared. Coriolis parameter F is approximately 10 to power negative 4 second minus 1 for the latitude where I am, and this is Montreal, and that is 45 degrees north, 45.5. And let's say that the inclination angle S is very small, 0 0.1 degrees, extremely small, so that we can use these Taylor series approximations. With these input values, the, uh, the width, this dimension, this dimension, let's call it B, breadth, width of this uh, plane would have to be approximately 3,000 kilometers, 3,000 kilometers to have this effect. This desk is one meter wide. We need 3,000 kilometers to see this effect. 3,000 kilometers is approximately distance between Montreal, where I am now, and Vancouver on the west side of Canada. If we would have plane like that, and this angle of inclination, then, and of course we neglect friction, which is never the case, then we would be able to observe this 
nice cycloidal motion. So effect is extremely small and negligible on our everyday scales, but these distances are nothing significant for parcels of air and parcels of water in the atmosphere and the oceans, and therefore Coriolis force plays extremely, extremely important role in these types of motions. But if you take a chalk and you start throwing it around, you don't see Coriolis force effect. Theoretically it exists, but the distances and times of flight are so small that we don't see it. Until next video, goodbye.